The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. Keep there, please, and uh, open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 24, Matthew chapter 13, beginning in 24, it says 23, but we're going to start in 24, and uh, the title this morning of our message is The Kingdom of Heaven, as the Lord instructs us. Let's ask the Lord's blessing and look to His Word. Father, thank You for the opportunity to receive this morning from Your Word, and Lord, we know that you use the word in our lives, and so we come with a heart of receiving, of humility, of, of being desiring, Lord, to learn and to change and to be transformed. So we look to your word by your spirit this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're continuing through Matthew 13, and we've come to the part where Jesus is teaching the parables. And, of course, the parables are very important for us to understand and particularly, there's a theme in the parables we're going to look at today, which is uh, parables concerning the kingdom of heaven. And as he describes, the kingdom of heaven is this. But first of all, I think it'd be important to remember why Jesus taught in parables. And we understand a bit of that because Matthew 13 gives us some insight. And really, we see two things. Firstly, that parables reveal. And he tells us many times to those who have an ear to hear, let him hear. And in over and over again, he talks about hearing. Everybody has an ear, but do you have an ear to hear? For those who have an ear to hear, then a parable uh, is a way for the light to come on and you say, oh, I get it, I understand that. Okay, you built a picture right next to that truth and I get that. And that really helps me to understand it. So it reveals a truth. But it also conceals. Now, you say, well, why would the Lord want to conceal? Well, because there were those with hard hearts. They were not there to hear at all. They were there to try to find fault. They were, there, they were listening for a mistake. They were listening for uh, something that they could use to accuse. And so the Lord uses a parable to, to conceal. Interesting. Now, it's also good to understand that parables in general teach one main truth. And I think that's important because uh, there have been those who have tried to, uh, try to extrapolate and parse and nuance every theological aspect possible out of a parable and, and I think get in some great theological deep water that way. So it's helpful to know that. And I think also uh, uh, parables are given in things that we can relate to. In other words, Jesus used... Uh, illustrations, stories, things that we can uh, relate to. Well, I should say they could relate to. Uh, you know, for example, on the first parable he gave, he talked about a farmer who would sow his seed. In those days, a, a farmer would walk, you know, and, and just have a bag and he'd pick up seed and kind of filter it through his fingers, you know, as he went like this. Well, we don't do that today. But in that day, those listening would have said, yeah, I get that. I've done that myself. And they could relate to that right away. And Jesus, of course, the ones we hear today are those that they can relate to. And so that's important. He's building a connection with them as well. And uh, so when we think about the parables today, and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, I think this is really important for us to understand. We need to hear it. You know, so many times, in fact, I think 19 times in this chapter alone, the Lord talks about the hearing. Mark talks about what you hear. Be careful what you hear. Luke talks about be careful how you hear. Let him who has an ear hear. Listen to what he's saying because the kingdom of God is important for us to understand. You say, well, why? Because it, every, uh, it has every bit of relevance to what's happening in the world. And, you know, when you think of the kingdom of heaven, of course, our mind focuses on the word heaven. Now, we all have a concept. Many people have a concept of heaven. And uh, when they think of heaven, 
then they think of, of course, everything is right. Everything is in order. Everything is holy. There's nothing that's sinful, nothing that's bad. Everything is being blessed of the Lord. And I think that would be accurate and true. However, when you think of the earth and the kingdom of heaven on earth, that's where a lot of people have a little trouble because they have this great and wonderful idea of heaven and have a hard time understanding why aren't those things that will be true then, why aren't they true now? And, and therefore they ask questions uh, that come out of that, such as, why do the evil prosper? Why does it seem that injustice is growing? If God is on the throne and God is over all and there's a God in heaven, why are, do the wicked prosper? Where is, why is injustice allowed? And this is interesting because Jesus actually addresses that when he discusses the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm convinced when you look at these things that Jesus is giving us this insight so that we're not surprised, so that we're prepared. Therefore, our faith is not shipwrecked. We understand God told us in advance about these things so that when we see them revealed, we say, Ah, yes, I know. God told. Jesus explained that. And therefore, I trust them. Because when you look at the whole thing, the, one of the conclusions you're going to make is Jesus' encouragement that God is sovereign over all and that he's going to settle accounts in his own time and in his own way. And when you understand that, you can just release all of these things into his hand. You know, don't you do this sometimes? Don't you read the news and, and realize, man, there is something going on. Am I the only one? There is something going on. There is an undercurrent of something that's dangerous and dark and powerful that seems to be building under the surface, and it's only a matter of time. Don't, don't you get that sense? And you look at all of that, and, and there's a part of us, I think, that would be very worried and concerned. Like, oh, no, oh, no. What does this mean? How bad is it going to get? What about me? What about my family? What's going to happen? But when you read the Scriptures and understand that God gave us these things in advance so that our faith is assured and that God is sovereign over all things, then we can say, you know what, God? I'm going to trust you with it. I'm not going to try to solve it all or to figure it out or even think of if I should counter it. Lord, I'm going to trust you that you have eternity in your hand. And there is that encouragement that we receive because Jesus tells us in advance that things are going to happen. Now, for example, we get to the first one. Now, let's summarize the first one this way. Do not be, don't be surprised by tears. Now, we're going to see that. We're going to understand it. But this is something for us. Don't be surprised by tears. Let's look at the parable beginning in verse 24. Now, he presented another parable to them. So we're just going to read it, and then we're going to jump to the explanation. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, this is similar, but very different than the other one. Now, while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat, and he went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? Well, then how does it then happen that there are tares in the field? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Shall we pluck them out? He said, No, 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 no. Lest, while you are gathering them up, that you may root up the wheat also. Allow both to grow together. That is, until the time of the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather up the tares, bind them in bundles, burn them up, gather the wheat then into my barn. Now, jump down, if you would, to verse 36. We're going to come back and get those other parables in a bit. But jump to verse 36, because this is where Jesus gives the explanation for that parable. Then he left the multitudes and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, uh, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. 
Like give it a nice little title even. Explain to us this parable, the tares of the field. And he answered and he said, Now the one who sows the good seed, this is the son of man. And the field is the world. Now as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angel, angels. Now there it is. Isn't that straightforward and simple? You can just imagine the disciples listening to that. Okay, that, can you give it to me one more time? I think I got it. I mean, he, they, he goes through and just explains every part of it. It's a wonderful, clear explanation. And then he goes further. And he says, Therefore... Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom, out of his kingdom, all stumbling blocks, all offenses, and those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now, he who has ears, let him hear that. Now, this is interesting. And he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is not, he's not addressing heaven eternal, but he's talking about what God is doing on the earth. And he even brings it up to the end of the age. Therefore, we can see that we're in it. And he gives us tremendous insight that we need to understand. Now, at first, it may seem very similar to the one, the parable we just learned last week. The sower sows his seed. Now, in the parable we just learned last week, Jesus is talking about there are different hearts that receive the seed. The seed being the word of God. And some seed falls on hard places and is not received at all. The birds of the air, he says, which is a picture of the devil... The birds of the air come and take the seed, and it has no impact at all. Uh, then there are others with a shallow heart. They receive it, but then when troubles, difficulties come, then they're offended and it's gone. Then there are others with a crowded heart, and there are thorns and thistles, and they choke out the word, and and, uh, uh, and then there are those with a good heart. So at first it may see there's some similarities, but it's not. It's very different because he talks about the seed that's being sown as the sons of the kingdom. Believers, God is planting. God is sowing believers around the world. Now there's a picture for you, don't you think? God is sowing and he takes the believers and he sows them around the world. And plants them there. Now, I just think that's a wonderful picture. You, got, you kind of get this sovereign picture of the Lord just on the earth, the picture of what he's doing, you know. And he, he moves and plants the sons of the kingdom wherever he desires. But then he says, the enemy comes and sows tares also in the world. And so here's the thing that he explains that we need to understand, that wheat and tares grow up together. Wheat and tares together are growing. Now, this would be a good time to explain what tares are. Tares are uh, weeds, but they are a particular kind of wheat. Uh, darnell, most think that they are darnell, because darnell looks exactly like wheat while it's growing. The, the greenery, the leaves, the whole thing, but... Later then, when it comes up, it doesn't put up wheat. It puts up darnel seed, which is poisonous. And the seeds look similar, interestingly. They look similar to wheat, but they're poisonous. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, if you have, let's say, about three-fourths of a pound of darnel seed mixed with 100 pounds of wheat, that's enough to kill a horse. And so, uh, now, interestingly, also, it's not fatal to humans, but it will make them very sick. I did a little bit of research, thought you might like for me to just tell you about it. Let me read it. The chief t uh, danger to human beings lies in the difficulty of sifting darnel from wheat and other cereals of much the same size grain. Ground up with flour in this way, it has caused uh, many cases of human poisoning. 
although not fatal. There is a famous case quoted by Johnson and Sowerby in which 80 inmates of Sheffield Workhouse, this was in England, were affected with violent vomiting and purging after eating oatmeal that had been contaminated with Darnell. How about uh, this? Darnell poisoning induces giddiness, drowsiness, uncertain gait, and stupefaction. It kind of creates a drunkenness effect. Now, this is interesting, don't you think? Because he uses it as a picture of what the enemy is doing in the world, right? And it creates a stupefaction effect. And in the older animals, it causes vomiting, convulsion, sense of sensation, and death in animals. The symptoms in the horse are dilations of pupils, vertigo, uncertain gait, and trembling. Animal, the animal will fall, the body is cold, and extremities are stiff, uh, stiff. Respiration is labored, pulses slow, convulsive movements of the head and limbs, and eventually death within 30 hours. Pigs will foam, convulse, paralysis has been observed, stomach and intestines. Oh, isn't this encouraging as we read? But it, see, this is, this is Darnell, and it's similar to wheat. Now, what's interesting here also is that he tells us that the enemy did it on purpose. The enemy did it on purpose. So in that day, it was fairly common that a mean-spirited farmer would try to harm his competitor, the, the farmer across the valley or whatever, by deliberately taking Darnell and ha hiring somebody to go and sow the guy's seed with Darnell. Because... Either he's going to have to painstakingly take them out, or he's going to have to burn the whole field. And, and, and that's an interesting thing, don't you think? That if there's a field which is absolutely infested with Darnell, the thing to do, you know what they had to do? They had to burn it. Now, we understand in Oregon, we understand burning, because uh, we, in our area, have burnt the fields. And, uh, and they did that as well to get rid of Darnell. It's an interesting thing, don't you think? So when the servants asked the landowner if they should remove the tares, and this is important, he said, no, don't remove the tares, allow them to grow, because in removing the tares, you may damage the wheat, which, of course, are those who belong to the Lord. Don't, he said, don't take them out, allow them to grow. So... It's interesting because Darnell and we look so similar to one another. And so when you look at this and understand what he's saying, he's talking about, of course, false religion, that the enemy is going to infiltrate the world with false religion. They say, well, what's it going to look like? If he's going to make something false, what's it going to look like? Well, I think we could use perhaps... Uh, a, a counterfeit bill as an example. If someone was to create a counterfeit bill, would they make it red? No, of course not. They're going to make it as close as possible to the original so as to try to confuse and deceive. Would that not be true? And so therefore, in fact, do you know how uh, bank tellers are trained to detect counterfeit bills? Interestingly, they are trained to detect counterfeit bills by giving them so much of the real. They are asked to count over and over and over and handle large sums of cash money so that they can know what it feels like and get so used to it in their hands that if one is slipped in that's counterfeit, they go, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't feel right. It looks just the same, but the, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't feel right. And so that is, I think, an interesting analogy for us. Because we want to know that which is real and that which is false. And the best way to do it is to know the truth, to know that which is from God, to know that which He speaks, that which He gives. The more that you know of the truth, the more you will be detect that which is not true. Amen? Now, while we're on this, can I take a side note for just a moment? Because there's a difference, a great difference between false religions, those that did not come from God, and the fact that there are many denominations or many church movements. I see nothing wrong myself at all with having several church movements happening at the same time. Although, interestingly, the church is criticized by the world because of that. Did you notice that? 
Uh, it's been a long time. The world likes to criticize the church and say, look at all these denominations. That, that says something about all this stuff that's bad, you know, and, uh, and divisiveness in the church. But I disagree completely. I disagree completely. I think it, it's a fine thing to have different denominations and different church movements. And here's why. Here's my thought on this. Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors. On purpose. And I think that's a good thing, right? If Baskin Robbins only had one flavor, how much ice cream would they sell? Well, they would sell a lot to the one who liked that one. But it's great because you might like... Uh, Cherry, I happen to like Jamocha Almond Fudge. <laughs> now that is ice cream, my friends. But I think it's perfectly fine that you like one flavor and I like another flavor. And I look at the churches. You know, I have the opportunity to meet and pray with pastors from all over this community every week. There's a bunch of them that gather right here in this church. And we pray together, we worship together, we encourage one another, become friends with one another, and I tell you what, I love all of them. And there's from Pentecostal, Baptist, doesn't matter, I love them all. And the thing that I, I look at is the fact that, hey, there's all these different churches with different flavors. It's perfectly fine. That church has a different flavor than our church. You're in, this church has a particular flavor. Of course, we love to eat, so we can relate to that. Uh, this church has a particular flavor, right? I mean, people that, uh, that come here, they, we want the Word of God. We know the Word of God is going to be taught. Well, wonderful. That's the flavor. Other people say, no, no, no. I want this or I want that thing. Okay. But you see, the flavor is just one thing. The banner of Jesus Christ is the main thing. And those who love the Lord, you can pick whatever flavor you want. Just love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't think it's a criticism, that fact that there's all these different church movements. I think it's wonderful, as long as the name of Jesus is the center of the church. Amen? Now, that being said, let's go back to our story. So, how do you discern that which is false from that which is authentic or real? Well, we get some interesting scriptures. How about Galatians chapter 1, verse 8? Paul writes, Even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel which is contrary to what we have preached to you, let him be accursed or anathema. That's a strong statement. He is saying here, the gospel which was given to you by Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, that which God gave, that is the gospel that must be taught. That's, if anyone comes with anything contrary to that, no it's not going to be okay. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? I want to show you something encouragement. Because here we have 1 Corinthians 15. Here we have one of those, you could say, proofs or evidences of the authenticity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning, if you would, in verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. This is the proof, the evidence, the fact that substantiates what we believe. In fact, the scripture says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is useless. But if Christ has been raised from the dead, you are standing on solid ground. And that's what he tells us. There's proof and evidence. There is an important distinction. Do they believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Let it become a test. Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? For since a man, or by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection from the dead. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. All in Christ shall be made alive. And there we get that tremendous help that support and encouragement. There is a test. There is a way to test. In fact, it's interesting in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. It said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not be naive. Don't believe every spirit. There's kind of a movement today. It's been going on for some time. Kind of an eclectic movement that says, you know, we can just, uh, all things are fine. Whatever you believe, it doesn't matter. Let's just all come together and love one another right now. And that's kind of the thing. 
You know, let's just all love one another. Let's all get along. Let's just all be nice. Hey, I'm all for being respectful. And I honor the choice that people have in freedom. But I'm after what God said. I'm not interested in what man said. I want to know what God said. I don't care what Nietzsche said. I don't care what Buddha said. I want to know what God said. Amen? And there's a, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Here's the thing. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, interestingly, going back to Matthew 13, one of the things he then said was, wait until the harvest. Hey, there's a harvest coming. Wait until the harvest. Let the tares grow up. False religions are going to be there. You know, you, you look around and say, man, the rise of Islam. He said, they're going to grow. Isn't that what he's saying? They're going to grow. But the wheat's going to grow too. And he said, let them be. Let them both grow. He said, I don't like that. Jesus said, no, you just wait. Wait for the harvest. Wait till the end of the age. God is sovereign over all things. And that's what he says. Wait. Both we will be allowed to grow together until the end. Then the tares will be separated. There was a... Uh, time when uh, Larry King Live, the program member Larry King, he had Billy Graham on as a guest. And uh, so here's Billy Graham, you know, on, on Larry's program. And uh, Larry King asked him, do you think, Billy, that things are getting worse today? Billy Graham answered and said, yes, things are getting worse, but they're also getting better. And he said, well, can you explain what you mean? And he said, absolutely. He said, Jesus gave a parable. Now, <laughs> whenever somebody's on national television and says, Jesus gave a parable, my heart just kind of warms. Jesus gave a parable and he said that the wheat and the tares, those which are not believers, the wheat and the tares will grow up together, but at the end of the age, they will be separated. And he says, therefore, the tares are getting riper. But the wheat is getting riper also. And Larry, soon the Lord is going to send out his angels with his sickle and he's going to gather the unbelievers up and send them into the everlasting fire. And Larry said, okay, well now, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> and he's getting fired up there. So the Lord doesn't want, the scripture says, let them grow up together. Do not let the church be harmed. Why? Because he loves the church. He says, don't, don't let them be harmed. Let the church grow up. Don't, you know, try to remove those tears because you're going to harm the church in the process. We you know when you're, when you hear, there's tears, maybe there's tears in the church, you know, whatever. And the temptation is to go on the attack. You know, the temptation, you know, there's tares out there. And the temptation, we're going to remove them, we're going to go on the attack. But it's interesting because Jesus describes the church as sheep. And the, uh, the concept of attack sheep just doesn't work with my head. You know what I'm saying? You, the scripture says, leave them beside still waters. You know, let's not take them across turbulent waters. Keep your rifles over your shoulders. You know, you can just imagine the sheep. The sheep are not made for the attack. Jesus said, this is John 21, 17. Jesus said to Simon the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, you know I love you. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to feed my sheep. That's what we need to do. I want the wheat to grow up. I want you to feed my sheep. That's what I want you to be about. That's what I want to have happen. I want the wheat to grow up. Don't worry about the tares. I'll handle the tares. End of the age will come. I'll handle that. I want you to grow up the, tear, the wheat. You know, if a pastor decided, you know, he's going to root out the tares. You know, maybe there's a, you don't know, there might be a tear in the church, you know. We're going we're gonna to root out the tares. And he starts preaching a message, you know, of fire and brimstone and condemnation. You better examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith, you know, and get all worked up and fire and brimstone and come. You examine, and you examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith. And, you know, here's the thing that's going to happen. First of all, tares, they don't have ears to hear. They're not going to hear that either. But you know who is going to hear it? 
that dear, sincere saint who's going to listen to that message. So he's, he's, he's really trying to bring correction to me. I must really be in a bad place, and they're going to go home all discouraged and downtrodden, and, the, and the, the sheep are going to end up being beaten over that. Why are you beating the sheep? Gee, I want the tares to, I want the wheat to be built up. Feed my sheep. See, our faith and our hope is that God's going to sort it out in the end. Our mission, if you choose to accept it, is to speak the gospel. The gospel is called good news. We are to give the good news. Do you not know it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? And so therefore, build the church, strengthen the church, and those who have ears to hear will hear. And they'll produce fruit, 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold. You know, uh, I was mentioning before about our pastor's gathering and, and the fellowship. Every once in a while, someone, uh, one of the pastors will uh, take a church in another state, you know, or whatever. We'll pray for him and send him off. And, and, I, and several times I've thought, you know, what would I do? You know, if, if I was asked to, to, you know, go to another state, I don't even think I'm saying anything. I'm, this is my home. I'm staying here, okay? But I'm mean, just thinking, you know, well, what would I do if I was asked to go to some other state, you know, and, and to, to pastor a church that was in trouble or whatever, and they were difficult people and all kinds of difficult troubles were going on. And I thought, you know, I think I know what I'd do. This is, this is what I think I would do. I would find those people that love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and I would pour my life into them. Wouldn't fight or bicker or trying to counter or bring weight against the other ones. You know what I'd do? I'd just focus on those who love the Lord. And there a little ember would begin. And then we would see that more would catch hold of that. And it would become a, 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 something even more brighter, a glowing ember. And then the coals would be added, and then it would begin to strengthen. And those who are on the outside either would say, i got to change or i got to go. And that's the church when it is alive. i got to change or i got to go. Either i got a ear to hear or I don't. Amen? And there's what we see. Now, our time is running fast, so let's get back to Matthew 13, because we still want to look at the two other parables. Notice what it says. Jump to verse 31, and let's summarize these next two parables this way. Don't be surprised, then, at birds or leaven. Don't be surprised. He gives us this warning in advance about the condition of things. Look at this one in verse 31. He presented another parable to them, saying this, Now the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And by the way, one of the ways to understand the parables is that when he says the kingdom of heaven is to be compared to, it's not the very next thing he says, but it's the whole of the picture. It's the whole of the picture he's painting. When he says the kingdom of, of heaven is to be compared to this, a man sows his seed and then he, and the enemy comes and sows tares among it. This is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. He's giving us a warning that it has to do with the things that are happening in the earth. Heaven eternal will be very different. Now, interestingly, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, this is smaller than all other seeds. Side note, people love to criticize the church, right? People love to criticize the gospel. One of the, the criticisms is, now wait just a minute, the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed in the world, you know. Okay, he's not talking about orchids in China, all right? He's talking about, for them, the smallest of their seeds that they are familiar with is the mustard seed. Are you with me? All right, don't you just love it when people... You see, when someone says that, can I, can I tell you my heart on this? When someone says, now wait just a minute, you know, that's not the smallest seed in the world, you know, in China somewhere, there's an orchid that's really smaller. My response is, now here is an example of someone who doesn't have an ear to hear. Here is an example of somebody who has an ear. They're listening to try to find fault. So they're reading through the gospel. Aha! I think I found a fault. 
Okay, let's get back to our story. So, the mustard seed, which is smaller than all other mustard seeds, when it is full grown, it's larger than the garden plants, and then he describes, but becomes a tree. So that even the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And here's the thing we need to see. Mustard trees are too big. Mustard's supposed to be a bush. They might be a big bush, but they don't grow in the trees. They're not supposed to. It's like an abnormal, it's like a false growth. And something happens when it, gets, when it gets to be like this, something's wrong. Even birds of the air. Now, there's a thing called ex expositional constancy. It's a big fancy word which means let's look for constant meaning of things. For example, Jesus just gave in the parable before that the devil is pictured as the birds of the air. And the very next parable then, we would correlate one to the next. So therefore, he's describing these birds of the air that the mustard tree is so big that birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He's giving us a warning, don't you think? There's an abnormal growth. There's almost a false growth. Be careful. It's a warning. Because when it gets so big, success, birds of the air will come and nest in its branches. And there is an interesting thing that occurs to me. Success itself can be a great trouble. And churches can find the same thing is true. And therefore, I think that it's very possible for churches and pastors to have what I could call perhaps spiritual greed. You know what I mean by this? It, it's the hunger to simply grow the church, just to have a large church. And do whatever method or technique or whatever it takes to get that way. But the trouble is, wait a minute, the church is Christ's bride. You, you, wait just a minute now, this is not for you, this is for Jesus Christ. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And when, when the birds of the air start coming, there's trouble that's coming, there's something wrong. If God blesses because you've built on the word of God and fed the sheep, that's one thing. But taking advantage of the sheep, that's a whole other thing. Have you ever, ever watched Christian television? I don't much, do much of it myself. Because I think, frankly, it's mostly discouraging. And here's why. I see a, a trend on Christian television, at least years ago when I saw it. I assume it's still the same today where many pastors would, would, would gather people and say, now give, give, give as much as you can possibly give, and God will bless you tenfold, a hundredfold, you know, send a thousand dollars in. Meanwhile, they're living fat and high in the hog, and everything's all with them. It's all, it, meanwhile, oh, whether it's grandma or aunt, and they're, yeah, you send it in, you know, send all you got. I remember one time I was at a pastor's conference and uh, I was at his table and Pastor Chuck happened to sit down and, and uh, so I thought, hey, here's an opportunity to ask some questions. And so I said, hey, what do you think of this? What do you? Then I said, well, actually, what do you think God thinks? What do you think God's view of that is? And he looked at me with a straight, dead-on face and he said, I think God is flat angry because that's his church. He loves his church. Whew. Isn't that not true? You know, the scripture describes the church as the bride of Christ. And I think that's a great picture. I love my wife. And I'll defend my wife. See, there's that picture. Hey, she's my wife. And I'm the husband here. You kind of get the picture? And there's, there's the Christ. Hey, this is my wife. This is my bride. This is my church. Can I give you a scripture that I think would help us a lot? Would you turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 34? Because occasion like this happened in Israel. Ezekiel 34. Beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying this. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. 
prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep and you're not feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and severity you have dominated them. Jump down to verse 11, would you? For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, I will care for my sheep. And I will deliver them from all places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on mountains of Israel by the streams and inhabited places of the land. And I will feed them with good pasture. And their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. And there they will lie down in good grazing ground. And they will feed in rich pasture. On the mountains of Israel, I will, feed my, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. Now, isn't that the heart of the Lord? And so there, you see, God is giving us a picture that's so helpful. Jump with me back to Matthew 13 and notice the next parable. He spoke another parable to them, verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three packs of meal until it was all leavened. This is a very short little parable, one verse really. And there we gain a great insight as well. Be careful. Do not be surprised. Leaven will puff up many. See, he gives us this warning in advance so that no one is surprised when these things are revealed. Jesus said, beware of the leaven. See, wheat is used to make bread. Bread, the great picture of the church. Jesus described that he was the bread of life. It's a picture. You, wheat is used to make bread. And he said, I, I want to let you know in advance, there will be leaven. It will happen. It will be there. Beware of the leaven. And in fact, he warned the disciples, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, a light went on. I get it. Matthew 16, 12, the disciples, it says, Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, what was it about the Sadducees and Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were adding to the Word of God. How so? Jesus accused them and said, You do not honor the Word of God, but you add by all of these traditions and things. And so they were adding all of these great burdens and requirements that God never intended. And they're adding and heaping and adding and heaping and great burdens were added to people. They're adding to the Word of God. Sadducees, what about them? No, they were taking from the Word of God. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in, in, in the spirit realm of the Spirit. They didn't believe in resurrection from the dead. Jesus accused them and said, you err because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Don't add to nor take away from. Feed my sheep and give them the full counsel and all of the word of the Lord because I love my sheep. I love my church. And yes, there's going to be love and I'm telling you in advance. I know. In fact, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he said, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. I don't know, that's just kind of a neat picture. You're a new lump, folks. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Man, when you know how much God loves, when you see how much God loves those he's called, and how much he wants us to love him back, you understand why he is giving these things in advance. Believe. God is sovereign over all. And you're going to see at the end of the age 
His sovereignty will remain. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word, the encouragement, the insight and understanding for our lives. You give us these great parables so that we would not be surprised. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to strengthen our faith and our trust in you. Lord, help us to understand that you love the church, you love believers, you desire to speak life and truth that the wheat would grow up. And Lord, we pray for those who are hearing that though they would have an ear to hear. Lord, I pray that faith would come by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That we would receive that word and know that you are building us in Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to receive from your word, to be blessed in you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, may God bless you.